<clears throat> All right, so uh, I'm sure you've heard me a lot this weekend, but this is the last time you'll be hearing me. Uh, so this is my presentation. Uh, so I'm just going to be talking about training for climbing, specifically for youth ath athletes. Um, so let's just, I'm going to put it to you, like what makes a good climber? Strength. What would you classify as strength? Um, well, for climbing, it's all about the ability to manipulate and move your body um, in the, you know, different positions, different movements. Yeah, it's a great description. So I'd say good climber is made up of a balance of strength, technique, root reading, all that sort of skill. Awesome. Perfect. Being able to pull hard behind. Yeah, that's definitely a component of climbing that's very important. Yes? Very social, yeah. And uh, I think that's what drew me into climbing at the, at the start. I never thought of climbing as a, as a sport. It was just like a fun hobby. And I just loved it that I could invite people to it and just have fun with my friends. And uh, this is what some friends from school and I used to do all the time. It was just like a once a week type of thing. And it just grew into like this amazing thing that's now in the Olympics. I remember having a conversation like early on uh, with people and said, oh, what sport do you do? And I said, rock climbing. And they kind of like laughed and be like, is that even a sport? It's like, yeah. And I explained it, broke it down. There's, there's competitions and nationals and world championships about this stuff. And yeah, it's now turned into an amazing sport that we're, we're quite lucky to be at like the start of. So we're still very young in climbing. So, so I've broken down uh, climber into about three different uh, things. So we've got strength, mental, and technical. So we kind of like had mentioned this. So strength, I would say, is finger strength, core tension, lock off, and I think mobility actually goes into that, being able to use your body correctly, uh, may, being able to have the range to then perform techniques. I think it's really important. Uh, then we got the mental side of it. So there's a big element of climbing that is just being able to commit, uh, to commit to a foothold, uh, to commit to a dyno that might scare you. Uh, first time often so in competition climbing it's having the confidence in yourself that you can do this uh, I think a lot of people maybe psych themselves out in competition and then things kind of snowball from that but going in with competi competition uh, confidence and commitment I think is really really uh, important uh, being to being able to perform under pressure so this is something that I'm trying to uh, get you comfortable with so uh, you're almost, so the gym can be a very social environment where you're just climbing with your friends, uh, you're not really caring so much about like if you get a climb or not, and then all of a sudden you're at a competition and then you're like, whoa, like this actually matters and this is important. So being able to almost get comfortable under pressure I think is super important for a competition climber. Uh, and you need to be tenacious, like fight for it. So. Often it's like who wants the climb more, sometimes that's the difference maker. So it's like sometimes you're going to have someone that is just maybe malnourished or maybe a bit tired or something that, like that, uh, and they're just mentally not, not there in, on that day. Uh, and then there's someone that just is going to fight to the living death, and that's, sometimes that's what matters. And then technical. So basically, uh, climbing in flow, making sure like the way you climb is beautiful. And then you've also got a high number of moves in your arsenal. So it's really important that you do pay attention to all these climbs on the walls. So generally, when the setter is setting a climb, there is a certain sequence of moves that they're intending to be, cli it to be climbed in. And basically, if you just do a climb and then just totally forget it the next day, then you're missing out on those lessons that the root setter kind of was teaching you. And then just if you forget that, and then in a competition, all of a sudden, so just like we were learning yesterday, like that wall run, um, if you are comfortable and you know that technique and you me memorize it and practice, then when you get into a competition, you already know what to do. Uh, if that is something new to you, then 
it's going to be so much harder. So getting that climbing experience with a, a number of different climbing techniques is going to be really, really, really important for uh, how you perform long term. Uh, you can't always rely on finger strength, I'm sorry. Very important to actually rely on or have technique as part of your focus. So let's start with me the mental side of climbing. So uh, visualization, I think, is one of the more underutilized part of climbing, especially probably in this group. So um, there's a lot that you can do with just looking at a climb and then visualizing you on it. Uh, so this specifically could be really good in lead climbing and competitions. So if you have that um, observation period where you're looking at a climb, imagining the holds, and then you go back into isolation, and then you just start playing handball or wrestling with your friends or whatever like that, you probably forgot what the holds were. You're like, oh, did I even look at this climb? If you use that time to actually think about the, the holds, uh, I know some people draw the climb in a notebook and you use that notebook to then picture themselves on the, on the wall. This type of stuff is actually so valuable. Like You can basically feel like you've done the climb before uh, just by looking at it and imagining. Yes? So you can't have it there, but you can definitely have it in isolation. So basically anything that isn't like a phone or technology, you can have. You can have a book, you can have a notebook, you can have cards. So if you do have that visual, so that, I, that time to observe, take that information back to your, the isolation and then make use of your time. Don't make it just all about having fun with your friends. Like you can do that most of the time in the gym, whenever you want. It's kind of like, it's almost a different mindset that you come into competition with, where it's like, it can be still fun, you can still enjoy the time with your friends, but also using the time avail available to you and giving you the, you the best chance to succeed, very, very important. Uh, so is the, being tenacious is kind of like the try hard. Uh, you really just need to be prepared to try as hard as you can for every single attempt. So you don't want to waste attempts. So this goes for lead climbing, because you only get one, but also bouldering, like what we were doing yesterday with how we we're, giving you you, we're giving you five attempts for, to complete a climb. If you just don't try hard for one of your, your attempts, you've only got four left, and you might not have learned much. So it's like you really need to make sure every single attempt you're visualized, then you try as hard as you can, and you, to, do, and you fight on that wall, and you try to pretty much get as much information from the climb as, uh, as you can. Because that's going to be your time where you can physically learn what's needed of you. So it's very important that the try hard is, is going to be co come into it. I was meant to put the reflection up here, so let's go to that. Um, so there is like three stages of learning uh, with a climb. So you do have the visualization, then you've got like the doing, so you're, you're learning by, by doing. And then if, you, if you're not reflecting, then you're really not actually gaining all that information. So you need to make sure that you are reflecting on your performance, on the climbs, climb itself, uh, what you could have done better, um, and then really try to fix those little bits of mistakes or errors and then bring them into the next climb. So if you're not doing these type of things, you're not going to be learning as much as you can. So every single climb that you ever do, even if it's easy, even if it's a yellow, it's like, did I do that the best? Is there an, another way that I could do that? And sometimes it's like, sometimes when I'm doing purples and oranges where it's like a dynamic move or something that, that's a little bit weird, I might find multiple ways of doing it. And that's kind of me reflecting on it, being like, did I do it the best way? Let's, let's try it again. Um, does anyone use visualization in competitions yet? Raising hand. Um, Sandy, how do you use visualization? Yeah. Yeah. Do you picture yourself on the wall as well? I try to, but sometimes I'm not that good. Yeah. Does anyone else use it in a different way? Yep, Kayla. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean like it takes time to be able to visualize visualize yourself in a particular area. 
I mean, like, it's hard because sometimes it's quite far away. So putting yourself in that position, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's actually good to, uh, that, like, drawing it, sometimes you can kind of put yourself in the, that place a little bit easier. Um, well, yeah. Also, if you do it, it's always important to check where you need to rest. The resting spot, that really a key also for you to keep going. Definitely. Yeah, resting is super important in climbing. And especially if you, we're talking about lead, um, which I know a, a lot of you are going to be doing. Um, not looking at your clipping positions, not looking at your rest positions, all that type of stuff. You're kind of leaving up to chance and kind of like improv. Um, some people can work that way. Some people can't. It's like you've got to understand yourself as well and whatever you really um, find helpful. But I would say it is valuable to at least try it and see if it will help. Because I, th I feel like uh, you can do a lot of this visualization and reflection and everything like this in every single session you have from now until nationals. So I think it's, it's very, very valuable. Um, and climbing with and clutch under pressure, we kind of said that uh, with being able to perform under pressure, being almost comfortable there, almost like if you go into a, into a climbing session with a friend that's about your level, just kind of like have a friendly competition. It doesn't need to be, be crazy, but just have a, re a reason to get it. So put five uh, attempts on a hard climb for you, and then really start to see if you can achieve that. Because if you just keep going, keep going, keep going, it's just like, all right, I did it, but I'm exhausted. I've wasted an hour of my session. Maybe if I just took a little bit more rest and then evaluate each attempt, maybe I could have got it done quicker, would have moved on quicker, and then would have had more time to then learn more moves and then get better as a climber. So really good to, to do that. And climbing with confidence, it's going to take a t some time to have confidence in yourself and to, be, uh, to go into a move with confidence. But I feel like the mindset that I go into a move, so like if I'm going into a dyno, I mean like, oh, no way. And then I'm just like, that'll do. Right? But so sometimes it's just almost knowing you can do it is a first step of doing it. So it's like just 100% believing that this is achievable for me. If you go outdoors, try a, your first V6, being like, I can do this. There's no, like, and I'm going to do it today and like really just like try to really focus on finding a way to do it. Do you have any other questions about mental, the mental side of climbing? All right, let's move on to the technical side, technique. So I, we kind of went through the sequence and reflect. Uh, I think watching climbing is a really good way of getting a good understanding of what, I guess, some, so if you're looking at high level climbing, you're seeing all of the moves that almost are like the new cutting edge things that the root setters on uh, the competition circuit are trying to uh, create. And so a lot of the times, the root setters at the, our competitions are going to try to recreate those in a way uh, for you. And so if you are watching these, these type of competitions, being able to already understand what's needed just by the patterns on the wall, just, why, just from what, how the, the holds are orientated, Super, super valuable. It's, it's going to uh, minimize the amount of attempts it takes to then learn the climb. If you can, if you can look at it, be like, okay, this is this is going to be a toe catch type of thing. It's, that's going to be super, super valuable. You're not going to waste as, as many as attempt, as many attempts as potentially you could have. Uh, climbing with better climbers. This can be hard, but youth programs are great for this. Many of you are already in that, but. Something that almost every good, like great climber has done through their, their climbing is just climb with people that challenge them. So people that are really high level, and they and it and again it can be a little competition. It doesn't have to be serious, but it can, but trying to see what they're doing, uh, learning from their technique, learning from their r rituals sometimes, like what they're eating, how they're sleeping. Uh, what they, how long their session is? Do they do they do um, mobility on the side? Do they do core training? Like what they did to get to where they are? Uh, really, really good information for technique. Um, 
because, yeah, I mean, like, I would not be where I was as a climber if I didn't have the, like, better climber showing me what I was doing wrong. And finally is, like, asking your coach. Uh, your coaches might not know everything, but it's good to just have that discussion as well. Like, I don't claim that I know everything. I just I am going to at least have a discussion with you to then maybe help, help you understand it better. Um, and, and yeah, sometimes that's all you need. You don't really need someone to then break down a technique to its finest point. Sometimes that's actually not that helpful. Sometimes it's just, uh, how did that make you feel? What did you change? And then you think about it a little bit more deeply, and then that's gonna, in turn, help your technique and uh, how you move as a climber. Um, and a little bit of trivia. Who are some of the climbers that we had? Who's this one? Uh, it's a little bit blurry. That's Lucy Sterling, which is uh, one of the, uh, she was the national lead champion for this year, or last year. Uh, she climbs out of Urban Climb a lot. And that's all you, or a lot of you anyway. Uh, and then, do we know who that is? Oh, there we go. That's, uh, this one's going to be a bit trickier, because it doesn't have his face, but maybe his yellow shirt helps. Yeah, okay. Uh, someone that's very famous for having a yellow shirt and eating carrots is Alex Magos. Uh, very, very strong climber, also very strong core. And I feel like core is very, very important in climbing. Without seeing this, why is it important? Find yeah, awesome. Anyone else? <laughs> Was uh, Malachi, did you have one? Good, nothing. No, don't know what's good? No, no, no. <laughs> is it empty? Yeah, awesome. Yep. Perfect, yes? Is it something you're more controlled Yeah. Excellent, awesome. Yes? Yeah, I think course when it gets to overhanging is going to be the difference between using a foothold and then having your feet cut off. So making sure that you do have, and when I'm saying core, it's not just your stomach. It's kind of like your lower back and your lat. It's almost like this entire trunk. Exactly. Totally. So if you've got a strong core, you can control positions that you probably wouldn't be able to previously, uh, and just get comfortable and confident, like going into things as well. It's gonna, it is gonna have like a protective layer there. So ways that I think are really good for training core. Uh, has anyone climbed on the spray wall at West End? That is a very good sports-specific way of training core. So basically climbing on a 45 degree angle wall uh, and there's so many things you can do. So you're, the entire time you've got your core tense, your shoulders engaged, everything, just keep those feet there. And then if you're trying to really work that core, try and have really bad feet is a really good way of doing that. So if you've got, if you've got massive footholds, you're going to be using a lot of your hamstring, you're going to be using a lot of your legs, which is good, great way to learn it. But if we're trying to work your core, Trying to use worse footholds is a really good way of actually knowing that your core's tense and you're pushing into that hold. It's gonna be really, really a good lesson and very sport specific, which is gonna be then directly related to how you climb on the wall. So uh, one thing that's very, uh, like used quite widely is bar core. Does anyone, can anyone tell me what bar core is? Santi? Yeah, anyone else? Perfect, yeah. Did you have anything else, Luke? Okay, exactly. So pretty much just core on a bar, You're just hanging. So you can do anything like front levers, uh, skin the cats where you kind of like bring your feet all the way over and all the way back, which is great for your shoulder mobility and strength. All these type of things, really, really valuable. Um, doing stuff like like L sits. It's good for your, uh, your fingers as well, just to get some low intensity type of activation of it. And it, and it is, again, quite practical for climbing. Um, it doesn't specifically relate to climbing in every single way, but there's a lot of crossover where the muscles that you, you're gonna be using for bar core are gonna be used for your climbing. So I think uh, getting into some bar core, or actually even just a super, super basic one for like probably like your 12, 13 and up, maybe not bad. Uh, 
floor core, something that who has done, has done some floor core exercises? Who hasn't done any floor core exercises? Okay, so name some floor core exercises for me. Yes, Jack. Dish, yes. Crunches. Crunches. B snaps, yes. Plank, Plank yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. B sits. B sits, yeah. Sit ups. Sit ups, perfect. We all know a heap of them. So this is all accessible to everyone. So you can do this at home. Uh, just having like a, a regular uh, core exercise routine that you do uh, is just really going to be valuable to you. Uh, basically, core can, uh, I say, is going to be valuable for like three to four times a week is going to be quite good. Uh, less than that, totally fine. More than that, you're going to, it's probably going to take away from your climbing quite a bit and you do want to ha keep all those muscles pretty much uh, ready to be used for your climbing as well. So anything that I say with regards to climbing, climbing is the best training for climbing. So let me j j just get that straight. So bar core, finger training, all this type of stuff, nothing compares to just climbing. Uh, and we're going to get into what strength training looks like for uh, age groups, and a lot of it's going to be just climbing, just saying. So, so uh, but yeah, floor core, uh, to like end the session or before you go to bed, these type of things, really, really good to just have to strengthen your, your body. So this is something that Jack kind of went through a little bit. So, finger training. You can see this person's using very... Uh, who is that? Because it's someone in this team, but I don't know. Who, is that you, Will? Because like, I was trying to figure out who that was when I put this... So this is in... This was here. Yeah, okay. It, it was someone from the state team last time we did our workshop here, and I just could not figure out who it was. Is Will? Maybe it's you. Okay, cool. I was like, so, yeah, okay, it's Will there, okay, because I had no idea, but I'm happy we figured it out. Uh, so finger training, spray walls, again, these, these, these type of, uh, sorry if the, the print's a little bit small, sorry, but... Spray wall, the uh, wall at West End, or just anything on a 45 or 30 or 20 degree angle that you're just going to be uh, climbing uh, just a bit more straightforward, like pulling on, uh, I would say is like a really good way of just like introducing your, you, yourself into some uh, like finger training for climbing. And again, very sports specific. We're not going to add, and then no, this is a very big avoid is no weighted hangs uh, for your age category, super unnecessary. And overtraining, having too many uh, like uh, finger or wrist type of exercises through your session, just really going to hurt you more than anything. Ariel? Like like Good question. So I should probably clarify. So there are body weight hangs, and so that's where you're, weight, you're hanging with your body weight. And then there's weighted hangs, which is you're adding weight to your body. So one of the girls that I coached uh, for quite a while, I kind of just, I saw her doing like added weight hangs, uh, and I just was like, oh, she'll be fine. I'm sure she knows what she's doing. But then end up getting like a stress, stress fracture injury in her fingers, and which is something that's super, super common for youth athletes and something that we're, try we're going to talk about later. Yes, Luke? What about exercises like um, weighted pull-ups? So, okay, there's three things that basically are, like contribute to... Uh, okay, so for finger strength, you probably want... That's not why you'll be doing uh, weighted pull-ups. Weighted pull-ups do have an effect on your growth plates, on, on, on your fingers, because you are still going to be weighting your, yourself over what your body weight is and what it's comfortable. So it is a contributor to um, fingers, uh, so like finger injuries. But the two other things that probably contribute to finger injuries more, uh, one of the most common, can everyone just get your hand out and then just put yourself in a crimp? Position. 
and then wrap your thumb over your fingers. So this thing, this position right here, so if I've got my fingers there, my knuckles go above it, and then my thumb wraps around the pointer. And so this position is the most common reason people have finger injuries. So especially as a young climber, uh, we're really trying to avoid that position. Uh, so if, by doing this, it kind of takes all of the work that your muscles are doing it and puts it right into that joint and you're wait, waiting down on, the, on these little joints here uh, with a lot more force than uh, you would in, with your thumb like out to the side. You could do a half crimp, which is like that, or an open hand like that. Either of those two are fine, but when you wrap that thumb over, it does tend to lead to is issues down the track. The other thing, yes, Santi. Yeah, so just with that position, it's like one of those things that is like a chronic thing, so that will build up over time. Very rarely doing this just once or twice is going to cause an injury. So it's going to be something that if, you, if it's a habit of yours as a climber, that's going to contribute to the injury, not if you just do it once or twice. So if you are getting to a really crimpy section in a competition climb or a lead climb or whatever it is and you need to feel powerful in those fingers wrapping your thumbs over I do it everyone does it but it's just something not to do as a habit make sense so the other thing that is a major concern for uh, younger climbers is campusing so especially if you're doing uh, those really big dynamic double bumps so uh, you're going to be doing, using a lot of contact strength, so you're like, well, and heavy weight coming down onto those, those small joints and bones. So uh, if you are going to do any form of campusing, make sure it's super controlled. And if you are doing it to work on your pull strength, there are better ways and more practical ways that you can use a bar than just using that. So uh, as a youth climber, there's almost no reason to be campusing. You want to work on technique more than just general strength. So the, those, those, tech, those campus boards that every gym has, uh, that's pretty much for the elite level climbers after the age of about 19. So uh, pretty much anyone in this gym, uh, if the, you, you are going to use them, it should be very, very minimal and not, like, not frequently and just for a specific reason. So if you're working like a something specifically, uh, you might add that once a week potentially, but all those gains can be achieved in different ways uh, that are probably a, li a little more safe for a younger body. Um, so wrist strengthening. So that's what Jack kind of went through with those, uh, those banded uh, wrist rolls. Uh, and so for, I'd say 14 plus, I get my the kids I coach uh, to do hangboarding uh, and weighted hangboarding, but it, so with body weight hangboarding. Uh, so I'd say pretty much 14 plus, I would say with monitoring, without monitoring is, very, is quite, uh, it's it just best to do it with a coach around. So technique is fine and you're just not overtraining because just like with everything as a, as a child, can be if you find some pro progress doing one s style of training, then just you want to do it all the time, and then overtraining occurs. Santi. Could you do like uh, body weight hangs on like funny little edges? So the body weight hangs on like those. So that you're talking about like a density type of hang where it's like low intensity, but maybe high duration, where it is definitely a form of uh, of hangboarding, but Pretty much all of those gains can be, you, can, can be gained, probably like spray walling, I'd say would be better than using uh, just, just hanging. So, um, but again, if you are gonna do a hangboard routine, like I'd say like 14 plus, this is the one that I use um, because it's, it's very interchangeable and so you can use uh, different hand, so what it is, it's called the repeater protocol. Uh, so I would say no more than two times a week. So one or two times, two times absolute max. Uh, so the way I use it with the kids that I coach, I use seven seconds on hanging 
and then a three second rest. And then seven seconds on, a three second rest for six sets of six reps with a three minute break in between. So, uh, the way, so what Jack said is fantastic with, with uh, walking around and doing all this type of stuff. Uh, this is the way I approach it. And I do think that if I was going to choose one type of hangboarding, this is the one that I do. Uh, so it's very easily changed where you can add like more rest period or a longer hang and uh, just like a longer rest period, all that type of stuff. So if I was going to do anything and when I do do my hangs for the kids I coach, this is what I use. And I would say pretty much 14 plus and always be with the coach. Uh, for this type of stuff. It's just best to know, uh, or be supervised, just so you're not overtraining and doing things like a little bit too much. Any questions? Okay. Uh, again, overtraining uh, is, is something that we're trying to avoid. Let's go through what growth plates are. Who knows what growth plates are? Good work. So when you're going through puberty or when you're just growing in general, all your long bones in your body, so all your, your, uh, your legs, your arms, your fingers, all these things that are really long, they've got growth plates on the ends of them. So they're bits of cartilage that kind of like grow out and then calcify over time when you mature. And so what you're trying to, do, so at all your age, you've all got growth plates right now. Well, most of you, especially the teenagers. And so we're trying to avoid causing damage to these. Uh, so things like those gripping positions like campusing and all this type of stuff, these are things if you do long term are going to probably cause these type of injuries. So, so a, it's a gradual onset of pain. It's not what we call acute where it's like a sudden bit of pain where it's like a particular thing happened and then this is what, what caused my injury or my finger pain. It's like almost like what you've done through the last few months and years that have then led up to this problem. And so this is what we're, we're trying to avoid. Uh, so again, there's no, there's no trauma or a specific event. Um, so a lot of the time the pain is like located on like the back of the knuckle or just like where the knuckle or like the long bone would join into the, the knuckle, that joint there. And so a lot of the times that's going to be where, so we're not, as youth climbers, you're not going to be worried so much about the tendon or like the A2 pulleys. Where you're going to be more uh, worried, right about, worried about stress fractures. And for a youth athlete, that's the most common injury for your fingers. So that's, that's generally what's happening with the weakening of the muscle at the end, of the, the bone at the end. Uh, so what happens when uh, these type of stress fractures occur? So does anyone want to tell me? So what happens? So if you have a stress fracture, if you're quite early in your development, uh, in your finger, then sometimes it will stop the growth of it. So you, then your other fingers will grow and, the, and it will stop. So that, that's going to be a per permanent uh, defect of, of your body uh, from that. Uh, decrease in range. So if you've got like a finger stress fracture, sometimes then you can't make a full fist or, or like extend your hands out entirely. So this is going to uh, affect you pretty much from now until forever. Yes. No, no, no. It's a good question. So basically, any. So it's just like a small fracture in the bones that happens at the growth plate. So it's, it's basically because it's not calcified and hardened th like a normal bone, because of this bone being a bit weaker, uh, there's go there can be just little cracks. There's like a few different styles of, of stress fractures. A few do so it can go from a, a, just a small crack or entire like, di like dislodging of part of the bone. Um, in that area. So there's probably about five or six different variations of a stress fracture, but it's basically just something that happens in that growth plate that, that adds some trauma into it. So again, it isn't just from an acute one-off thing. It's generally over time of doing uh, things that are causing this type of harm, like your 
full crimping or campusing or just overtraining a lot of the time is going to be causing that. So, good question. So, because you've got your long bones, so your legs joining up to your knees, uh, it can happen there, um, not generally in your climbers. So maybe it would be more for like your long distance runners or something like this. And they're bigger bones, so it, it's harder to happen in those bones. Where, but because they're such thin bones and small bones with so much pressure getting put into these tiny little joints, uh, it's quite common for the climbers to have these type of injuries. And so this is pretty much the main thing that I wanted to really get across is to be conscious that if there are, is little bits of pain creeping up in your climbing, just speak to your coach and then generally what I say is get it scanned or see a specialist because I mean like I'm, I'm not a specialist in this yet, I'm trying to study to be, but I would rather let's get it scanned, know what we're dealing with and just so we are going to get you to exacerbate the injury and then have the stress, fra stress fracture that we're trying to avoid. All right, cool. So things that we're trying to avoid, we've been talking about these a lot. Uh, campusing, weighted, uh, weighted climbing or weighted hangs. Uh, so both of them, so if you're using weights while you're climbing, it's un unnecessary, especially at this age. Uh, you're adding in more, uh, I guess, pressure into those joints if you're adding weight onto yourself. So really, really good idea to then just avoid all that type of stuff. It's very common for any climber to kind of get a finger injury in their second year of climbing because they get quite confident and strong and technical, but they're, they're kind of like ligaments and bo uh, haven't really caught up to that yet, and it takes longer for your lig ligaments uh, to strengthen. So very, very common to have a finger injury at, at around about that time. So it's just really good to just be open with what's happening and just make sure you're, you're telling your coach if anything's going wrong because it, their, their priority is to, to make sure that you're healthy and improving. And the one thing that is going to really um, stunt your progress is going to be injuries. It's like the, you could be the best climber in the world, but if you're injured, you're not climbing. So it's super important. Uh, strict diets, we kind of went through that. Dehydration with uh, Megan. Uh, dehydration, making sure you're well hydrated, got a b bottle with you, especially in summers in, in Queensland. Really, really important. And they've already shown you what a full crimp looks like and that we're trying to avoid those pretty much all the time, but you can use them when necessary or when you're really, really trying hard. Any other questions with uh, what we're trying to avoid? Okay. All right, methods of recovery. Nutrition, went through that. Sleep, so uh, we're gonna go through sleep in a little bit, but basically sleep is where most of your recovery will be done. If you're not getting your eight hours of sleep, you are not gonna be recovered. Mentally, physically, it's just not gonna be, you're not gonna be performing optimal. Uh, rest days, so if you're climbing seven days a week, you're probably on your way to a stress fracture or a muscle tear of some sort. So we're trying to limit your climbing days to about four, maximum five, because if you are climbing all the time, all of your climbing days are just gonna be medium. You're not gonna be recovered for them, so you're never gonna be performing in an optimal level. So what you should be doing is making sure you're, you've got a higher intensity of your training sessions, but you're making sure you've got that chance to recover between those sessions. So a lot of the best climbers in the world, they do climb a lot, but they've probably worked up to that. So we're, we're trying to make sure we are, every single time we're coming to the gym, we're recovered enough, we're, we're comfortable that we can try and make it a high intensity session where we are gonna get those strength gains uh, through that type of training. Uh, active rest days, these are important as well. Uh, so you can have a full rest day where you're sitting on the couch, or you can have an active rest day where you go for a walk or a hike or a swim or something completely different to what you, the muscles that you'll be using as a climber. So I think that would be good. And then just mobility, Jack kind of went through that, so I won't half on it too much. Uh, just kind of like making sure you've got a full range of motion. Using mobility is kind of like a part of uh, a bit of a recovery, even just like using those, the uh, uh, trigger balls and the, the theraguns, all those type of things. 
Uh, but yeah, just as serious as you want to take your training, you want to take your recovery just as serious because you're never going to reach your peak performance or gen your uh, genetic potential if you don't recover correctly. Because uh, if you're just constantly beating your body down, continuously beating it down, you aren't ever going to be performing at your peak. So really making sure recovery is taken seriously and those rest days are valued and taken seriously as well. So people can, yeah, good question. So uh, you can have a lot of different splits of how you do your climbing. So if, so, and, and it depends on the intensity of your climbing as well. So if you've only got, let's just say, two or three days of climbing, those climbing sessions can be really intense and your body can have like, need like two days to fully recover from it. But if you're gonna have like a uh, lower intensity session, then yeah, like two sessions, one off, three sessions, they're not gonna be very good sessions, but then having one off. Uh, so it, it's just trying to make sure the, if you are trying to really get those strength gains, those strength gains are kind of like, come, they come from uh, intensity of the work that you're putting in and making sure that you are really try, trying hard with the problems that you're doing or if you are like older and doing like a strength program, uh, making sure you're really committed to each rep of each set and then really just doing everything that is required of you. So uh, does that answer your question or? Yeah, yeah sort of, yeah. yeah. I mean, A s for kids, I think even just like, it's just trying to make sure, I'd say in seven days, trying to definitely make sure they're not climbing over five days. I would say the optimal would be about four. So with that, you're gonna have two days in a row, uh, which is gonna happen. Um, but, but yeah, if just making sure it's not every day. Uh, but yeah, I would say if I was going to say, the most would be five, and I would say four would be best. Make sense? Okay. Okay, why do we sleep? Uh, who likes sleeping? Who gets more than four hours sleep a night? Who gets more than six hours of sleep a night? More than seven? More than eight? Oh, awesome, sweet. So it sounds like we're all doing the right thing. I feel like a lot of the time when you are your age, it can be very easy to get distracted and then trying to stay up late or whatever. But it is very important that you do try to get your eight hours. Uh, a lot, so a lot of hormones are released through your sleep uh, that then contribute to your muscle gain and recovery and bone density. So if you're not sleeping well, well and for an extended period of time with deep sleep, you aren't actually going to meet, uh, meet your genetic potential again. So it's really, really important. So memory is almost uh, certainly um, affected by your sleep. So there's been many studies that have taken people uh, through a bunch of tests and, and got a, a gauge of like, or taught them something, and then a group of people had a nap, or, and then a, or like an eight hour sleep, and then the other group were up playing games or talking or had, had to stay up, and there was a vast improvement in memory uh, between, uh, for, of the group that slept over the group that were just talking and, and doing that type of stuff. So uh, really making sure that's, real, that's important. Your uh, muscle and bone health, all of that, a lot of your growth hormones are released uh, while you're sleeping. So making sure that you are getting your sleep for the muscles and bones and then performance. Yeah, you're, you're never gonna be performing. Sometimes before a competition, really easy to be super stressed and you can't sleep. Unfortunately, it, you, if, you've, if you did have a poor sleep, I mean, you're, like, you're gonna try 100% and you still could do very well, but there is science to say that you're probably at a disadvantage from what, if you did sleep well. Uh, so just making sure we're doing that. I know I sound like a mother when I say that, but um, it's important. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, who plays another sport? What do you play? Sarah. Um, Jiu-jitsu. Jiu Ooh, good one. Tennis, awesome. Yeah. Surfing, love surfing. Yep. Excellent. Athletics. Dance. Tennis, excellent. So, Luke. Uh, okay, <laughs> excellent. So, I think cross training at a young age is actually really, really good. Uh, very rarely do you need to specialize or get, get into like a almost like a professional athlete mindset until uh, I would say getting towards your teens or even later than that. It's really good to form a really good understanding of movement as a child and not all movement is climbing. So movement encompasses everything from jumping, swimming, like uh, dancing, uh, jiu-jitsu is great. Pardon? Paddling. Paddling, exactly, balance when you're surfing. So a few just j things that I recommend. Yes, Santi. Uh, what would you say in your opinion is like the best sport? I would say gymnastics. So I would say if you are going to choose one sport specifically for cross training, for climbing, I would say if I was going to choose one that has the most similarities but maybe a little bit different would be gymnastics, yes. Yeah, so I've got so I've got three oh sorry four different options here that I've kind of like written down. So gymnastics number one, and I'd say martial arts. So jujitsu, amazing. Uh, parkour, fantastic. I love that type of movement. Really coordinated. You learn how to use your body really really well. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean like there's just, there's just been a high quantity of athletes that kind of like started with gym, gymnastics that then went into to climbing and had a lot of success through that. So I would say like the type of movements you do as a gymnast really do complement climbing. But I know what you're saying with, how, with it's a more of a competitive scene where you take it seriously. But I do know there, there could be like weekend classes as well, so. One of the studies saying that like most climbers don't have a really good like heart and lung health because it's not really a cardiovascular. Yeah, you're not really using your cardiovascular system as much as you would for like a runner and stuff, so. But also you have to think, for everyone is trying to talk, like if you go, you were supposed to separate the young people a lot, but then after, you're going to have to be specific what you want, sport you want to choose. Yeah. Either you're going to be climbing or you're going to go to the other sport. And that's the choice yourself you will have to make. That's exactly right. Yeah, exactly. So especially when you're in your motor learning phase of your life where it's like your strength gains come from just learning a pattern better and learning how to have your brain connect to your outer limbs better. Uh, so all, the, all this type of strength gains and, and technique learning, it's, it, it just it, it really does help to kind of like have a really good understanding of how the body moves and have a, have, so I would say handstands is something that everyone can kind of do that is going to be quite good. good. Really watching out for your wrist health with this because I know some people if they do handstands uh, a little bit too much can have shoulder, elbow and wrist pain. But I would say for your awareness of your body, your proprioception, having uh, being able to hold a really nice handstand with uh, good balance and body position, very, very good to learn just so you can control your body in that position. Yes? Uh, would you recommend like parallettes That's a good point. Uh, so parallettes can be used. Uh, just be, just, so my biggest bit of advice for handstands is use a wall for like your first like two, three months of it. So it'll teach you, uh, there's lots of YouTube stuff on, on it, but using a wall, it, it will get your li line better. It's, uh, so you can use your parallettes. What parallettes are, just two bars that you hold, and then there's a bunch of different exercises. This kind of goes into that bar core that we talked about for your core training. Uh, and so it is 
uh, another great way of doing handstands, but you don't need to. You can just do, use the floor as well. Cool. Uh, but yeah, there is a time in everyone's life where it's almost like you have to choose if you are going to, if you do want to specialize and be a uh, professional athlete. Uh, I would say around like 15 is a, is a good uh, time to then, or like 16 is like, I, this is my sport, let's commit. Uh, you can kind of start doing that after 13, but if you do enjoy that other sport, just keep doing it as well. So yeah. Uh, good question. I think 30 seconds. <laughs> All right. I, uh, not right now, but we can afterwards. How about that? Yes. Yes. So, good question. So, the benefit that running has on your body is your ability to recover between attempts. This can be if you're at a rest position on a climb and you're, you're in a rest position, uh, you're, you will get energy back quicker if you have a good cardiovascular system or a high running ca cardiovascular system. If you are in a bouldering competition and you are attempting to climb and then you've got maybe a minute where you, you're resting, you will feel more rested and ready to go if you have got a, a healthy cardiovascular system that would be helped through running, but the actual act of the climbing itself doesn't really have much uh, crossover with, I guess, what you're using as running, but it can be very good for your mental health, very good for just kind of like, I use it when I'm studying a lot, so I just do my thing, and then I just go for a run, it clears my head, it gets me like breathing a little bit, gives me some exercise, and I come back and, and uh, get back to work again. But in relation to climbing, I think the best benefit it has is the, the rate of recovery between attempts or in rest positions. Yes? I have a question about when kids climb with leg climbing. Here we've got like 10 meter walls. Mm -hmm. It's Sydney for comp and it's 15 Great point. Walls. Mm -hmm. So our kids are kind of like don't have that. So, falling. yeah, it's a great point. The pump, yeah. So the, the way it's through training and, the, and how you train. So if you do think that the pump is going to be the issue of you being able to climb past 10 meters, so you can do, it's like just doing drills. So doing up, down, ups. So climbing up a hard route, climbing down an easy one, and then climbing up a hard route uh, is like a good way of be, simulating, like being on the wall for that amount of time. Uh, and it just gives you a little bit of a better uh, chance to feel what you might feel on a 15 meter, uh, 15 meter wall, even though there is going to be some element of rest through the down climbing on, on an easier climb. Uh, so it's not going to be has, as high intensity as you would feel in like a competition where it gradually increases in difficulty. But at least you, if you're training to get comfortable with climbing with pump, then that's a good way of doing it. Cool. So, Let's go into what strength training might look like. So, uh, for strength training from youth, for youth climbers between age six to nine, pretty much this can go up to about like 13 as well. Uh, so, there's, there is some overlapping between, between this and the next one. Uh, so, strength gains come from motor learning. So again, your, pro your muscles aren't probably like, getting much stronger. It's the way you're using your, your body that's getting better. And so pretty much all of the strength training you do is nothing compared to climbing. So, there, so when you're strength training for a, a climber between 6 and, and 9, I would say 10, 11, all can, can be added in this as well. Uh, all you need to do is climb. The, and having a, uh, like a consistent climbing schedule is going to be more beneficial than doing anything uh, too complicated when it comes to strength training, especially for this age. They don't, like, if you are going to do anything, uh, you can do some pull-ups and push-ups, but if that's taking away from their climbing, then don't do it. Uh, all of the benefits are going to come from that. 
so, uh, so yeah, movement orientated training. So stuff like those handstands or there's a lot of animal movement type of things that you can learn, like the, the bird dog or all these type of things that Jack was t talking about earlier. So these are things that are good to learn and just master or at least just play around with. Everything should be fun. Don't, uh, don't try to stress people, stress the kids out at this age. If, uh, if there's so, so yeah, you really want to make all of this to be just low intensity for like their stress levels. So for, for when it comes to that. But uh, yeah, I think um, for me, just a constant or a consistent schedule for climbing is pretty much the only training when it comes to f like strength training you need as a climber between this age. Any questions with that? So now we get to the 10 to 15s. So you still need to have a very high, uh, so we'll just go through this. So puberty happens through the, a lot of these ages. So. Uh, so peak height velocity occurs at ages 11 for girls and 13 for boys. So you're going to be shooting up, your arms are going to be gangly, like you're going to be gaining weight, things are going to be a bit weird. Your height velocity uh, peaks between uh, 12 and 15. This is where the growth, growth plates happen. So these are just things to be aware of that things are going to be changing and it's, it's natural. So if you're, you're gaining weight and all these type of th things, this, it happens, don't stress out as, as part of being a human. So just wanting to, to clarify that. And then let's just go to the things to do. So when we're getting into this age, we can start to actually start training a little bit more. Uh, again, you want to have the emphasis to be developing climbing techniques. Again, a very high consistent uh, uh, so high volume type, type of consistent training schedule is going to be the best way to train. Uh, there can be amazing climbers in this world that haven't done, a, done any push-ups. Like, I'll say pull-ups. Maybe push-ups are good just for antagonist training, but they but are just climbing uh, uh, consistently. But if you did want to add some strength training, this is where you can start doing it where you can start doing, I'd say, 20 to 40 minutes of strength training about three times a week. Uh, so these can be intense, but uh, we'll, we'll try to keep it sport specific, so you don't need to really add any weights here. Uh, so you can do, do a lot just with your body, uh, with, your, with bar core, all this type of stuff. This is where that starts coming into it. So uh, pull-ups, lock-offs, Hangboarding in small doses, very so small doses. So it kind of like goes into the like 14, 15 year olds here, um, and and again making sure that they're uh, minimal. Yes. What do you think would be the best like split for a climber? Good question. So I think uh, if I'm going to do a fitness or a strength program and climbing, all of that, all of the strength training and the climbing need to be on the same day. Because as I said, we're gonna, we need our rest days to be rest days. So if you are going to have a strength program, you should have the, that after your climbing session. Because again, what we're trying to be is climbers and better climbers, and you want to have your peak performance to be used through the climbing session. That's where you're going to be le learning your movement. That's where you're going to be trying to c complete complex movements that are going to be taking quite a lot of strength and power. And you don't want to have your climbing to be uh, affected by your training. So training should be the secondary to how much uh, what your value in your climbing. So, so again, if you are going to do any, it'd just be about uh, three times a week, 20 to 40 minutes. Uh, so, what are antagonist exercises? Perfect. What are some antagonist exercises for climbing? Yes. Push-ups. Any other one? Dips, yeah. Anything else? <laughs> Push ups? <laughs> what are they, sorry? Oh, I, I think I call it a Hindu push up. I don't know if that's correct anymore. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, uh, yes. Luke. Pardon? 
Yeah, Rom uh, Romanian deadlifts, they're pretty good. Anything else? Yeah, so you're working your antagonist. So a, so a lot of climbing, you're doing this. You're, you're using this group of muscles where you, you, they, so you're flexing a lot. And so to kind of like get a really healthy wrist and, and fingers, trying to work the opposite is good as well. So you're working on the back side of your extensors. So really good to, even just through your warm ups, just to kind of like, even just put some rubber bands on your fingers and doing this. So it's a good way of doing that, just to work the opposites. Uh, but yeah, one thing that I have that I think is really good for climbing, because you're doing a lot of this, something that we're not doing is this. So you want to do some overhead presses as well. So just light weight, correct form. Um, so you can start with like, so something that is in this position, what have we already talked about? Handstands, handstands yes. So again, handstands can be almost like a cross training, strength training thing that you're using for your, for your training for climbing. And mobility, kind of went through it with Jack. But yeah, super important. If you're going to want to reach your potential, you can't have those, uh, those issues with range. So we're trying to make sure that mobility training is just an uh, accepted part of training for climbing. And I'm going to challenge you. If, we all, if you all try to work on your mobility, those things that Jack did, from now into, until nationals, if you don't feel better on the wall, I'll buy you an ice cream. <laughs> All right? Yes. <laughs> that's fine. But if they do it, if they do it, that's the point. So if you do it, you have to do it, a regular uh, schedule of mobility training. If you do it and you don't think it's help, helped your climbing, I'll buy you an ice cream. But you have to have done it. So, okay. <laughs> Oh, I'll, I'll ask your parents. Sorry, I'll ask your parents. Yes, maybe uh, maybe video proof would be good. Parents, I'll believe. So how about that? <laughs> um, so I was just curious about the core muscles. Yes. Because I know that you know, if my own daughter, she has great core muscle but she doesn't actually know how to actually do those different movements. So what part of the training is that connected to? So we kind of talked. Yeah, you might have missed out on that because we we did. That's fine. We had a core section where a lot of the, the great ways to develop core is through spray wall climbing, where you're climbing on like a 45 degree angle and you're using bad footholds. So you've got to really keep that core tense and pushing into those feet. And that's definitely the best sport specific way to work your core. Uh, a lot of that tension comes from your shoulders as well. So this is doing like the push ups and overhead press really good way to make sure you're strong through the shoulders and holding those positions. So, but yeah, mobility, really good. Okay. Um, so this is for the 16 to 18 year olds. So growth plate's still an issue, making sure that we're paying attention. Uh, so you can start going into a more intensive, intensive climbing specific program. Uh, so this can include weights. So stuff like bench press, and deadlifts and all these type of stuff. Highly recommend not, not doing this on your own. I have the kids that I coach doing these things uh, that at a certain age, making sure that you're with a coach or someone at least that understands the technique, super important because injuries can occur and you need to build up to, to doing things like this. You can't just go into it head first. There, there's a lot of learning that your brain needs to do to connect to the muscles and all the, all the little muscle fibers and motor units in your body. So basically a lot of learning to try hard with this type of stuff is your brain learning how to use more muscles through that exercise. So you're not actually making many gains through the, like strength gains, like muscle gains through the first few weeks or months of training that you will feel like you are because you're, all your numbers are going up. But that's actually your body just understanding how to do the exercise better and then recruiting more muscle units to, to do that exercise. So you're actually not getting stronger muscles. Your mind's just learning how to use your body better. Uh, and that actually is, is a big way of uh, the climbing specific training and the motor learning of uh, the six to nine year olds. All it is is just your brain connecting to your body and it learning how to do things better. But again, don't 
so keep it simple with it, weight training. Don't want to go on to an insanely crazy structure. Uh, keep it simple. That's my biggest bit of advice. So training journals, who has one? So training journals are fantastic. It tracks your progress. Uh, so I, I still look back on some of the training journals I, I had when I was like 18. And then it's just really good to see what you're working on then and to see if, if you've progressed or anything like this. Uh, it also helps you stick to a program if you've got the book in front of you and you've got like a pro program written out for you uh, or something you've made for yourself. Uh, yeah, just like, okay, I'm doing this today. They'll tick it off, make sure things get done. So I highly recommend if you don't have one, just uh, buying a journal and then just start every, every climbing session you did. Just, I did three greens, one red, whatever it is, and just kind of like start keeping track and then just uh, see what happens. Uh, and it allows you to put your thoughts to paper. Sometimes if you're an anxious person, uh, you have a lot going on up here and maybe if you had a bad session, it's just good to write it all down and just have it there so then you can walk away being like, all right, it's done, uh, it's in the paper, now I can just worry about other things for a while. So uh, I do recommend that. Uh, let's keep going. So mobility versus flexibility. So mobility uh, is your active range of motion, your flexibility is your passive, so when you're helping it up. Uh, we're trying to mostly focus on mobility over flexibility. Uh, generally, uh, you're going to be safer in a position if you can control the range. You can be it can be quite dangerous to ha have a high level of flexibility but be weak there. So you, your joints can be in positions that your body's not capable of, of holding and then that's when a lot of injuries can occur. So making sure that the ranges that you can reach are active and your joints uh, have got some muscles that are stable and able to control those positions is really, really important. Uh, this can be achieved through strength training, mobility training. A lot of that overlaps. So a lot of mobility training does have an element of strength training in it. Uh, so benefits of mobility. Uh, improves your performance, decreased risks of injuries, kind of like as I said, if you've got flexibility and you're in a, in a weird range, uh, you can get injured there. Helps your jo joints uh, go through the full range, so if you, you, you can bring your knee up and out, all that type of stuff really helps for your heel hooks, all these type of things, uh, where it keeps your hips close to the wall. Uh, just, just really, really good. Um, but yeah, I, I, like Jack did talk about mobility a lot. Does anyone have any questions with the benefits of mobility? I'll just keep going. Um, so barriers. So a lot of the time, uh, pain is a barrier to uh, your range of motion, fear, and also muscle spindles. So muscle spindles are just like little bits of like, uh, almost a communication between like the central nervous system and the muscles. So if someone's like gets your leg and like fires it out here and you have that response to like have your leg kick back, that's the muscle spindles being like, what the hell are you doing? Like get back. And so that's almost like what you're trying to train through your mo the, through mobility train like mo mobility work is to relax those muscle spindles uh, to be able to be in that range safely and your mind to be a, be to allow yourself to be in that range because a lot of it all those issues come from your brain trying to protect itself or the body so really making sure uh, that we got a few uh, things that stop it are uh, also your bone shape sometimes is just hard uh, depending on how you are you develop sometimes it's just more comfortable to be uh, flexible and, and mobile uh, and then damage fr from surgeries also is a contributing factor I didn't want to spend too much time on mobility the age-old question no we'll just keep going because Jack went through that should you have a home wall who thinks yes? Who has a home wall? Do you like it? Okay. <laughs> Not much use of a home wall. Then, is it? Okay. This is probably more for the parents than it is for anyone else. Uh, so, who uses a home wall? Yeah. So, so Santi. Uh, 
So what do you use your wall for? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What, do, do you use, use yours? Uh, yeah. Um, it's so hard because it's very short and it's horizontally. Oh wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think if you have the ability to have a home wall, uh, it's really nice just to, especially for the young kids, it gives them a place to play and, and, and just like hang out. Uh, it allows you to have consistent sessions if uh, you're on like a summer holiday or like if you live far from the city. If you live close, and it doesn't really matter, you're close to the gym, but if you're far away and you find it sometimes hard to get into the gym, uh, there's so many YouTube videos on it these days, uh, how to build your home, home wall. But I actually do think uh, for most young climbers, like just having a wall at home, just something to play around on is actually quite beneficial. Gives it gives that consistency to uh, what they're doing. And if, if they do want to burn off some steam or whatever it is, they just go play and then you're like, it's just a great way to keep them entertained. Um, but yeah, just like with everything, it can be easy to overtrain if you have a home wall. So making sure those rest days are still a uh, really important part of your week. Uh, cool. So that is the end. Uh, is there any questions or anything? I think I did do a lot of questions through it, but... Good question, good question. So I would say that if, so what sport do you play? Well, I do cross the country and I also do soccer. Okay, well what's really good is that both of those sports don't really use the same muscle groups that you use with climbing. So the physical impact that it has won't really affect your climbing so much. So, but you do still need to have those rest days. So if you can somehow uh, plan your climbing days to be on the same days of, uh, uh, as those cross-country ones or your soccer and if it is possible to have the climbing before because that's going to be where you really need your energy and they're like for explosive energy uh, and then the other ones are probably more of an endurance thing where you can kind of uh, just it, it's not as injurious as like uh, climbing sessions so I, I would say if I was going to organize it perfectly, it would be, uh, you would have your climbing and your soccer and cross country on the same days, but the climbing to be the first thing you do and then the other things coming after that. So, but uh, if, it's hard, if it's like a gymnastics class or a jujitsu class, uh, they can be quite hard because you're gonna be quite exhausted from it. So it's just like trying to, Almost like know what you're prioritizing, if it's the climbing or if it's the jiu-jitsu. Uh, making sure that if, if you're going to do a jiu-jitsu class, uh, or one or two, maybe if you're climbing four days a week, doing like one session of jiu-jitsu, or climbing three days a week, doing two sessions of gymnastics, or whatever it is. Uh, but just trying to, if you are going to want to compete and become a better climber, that that is your priority. But these other things are kind of like the... Uh, what you're using to develop as a human, but this is still your focus. And don't, and don't forget your snacks. Yes, snacks are super important. <laughs> uh, cool. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Of course. That's the thing about being a child. It, it, you are quite time poor sometimes. You've, if, you're, if you're filling up your time with, a, with all these type of things, look, it's, it's hard to kind of like write a schedule for you, but I'll just say uh, make, make sure the things that va uh, you value the most, you prioritize those. So if it is your climbing, make sure that if you are writing out your weekly schedule, that you write your climbing in first, and then everything else goes after that and uh, making sure that you still have those rest days and, uh, and but yeah it's it's just trying to be consistent 
Um, and if, the, if climbing is what you value, making sure that's your priority, this goes in first, everything else around that. And then, in addition, because school is going to start, you do your work first, <laughs> and then you do climbing. You're climbing homework then first. You squat, <laughs> and then you do the but you do your work first. Okay? okay. <laughs> All right. Well, so. Sure, why not? But I just want to say thank you, everyone, for the weekend. Uh, again, really appreciative to see how many people show up and uh, attend these things. It uh, really uh, gives me uh, reason to keep doing it. So thank you for doing that. Cool. Let's, uh, let's have a group photo. <laughs>